What's up, everybody? Good to see everybody. Hope you're having an amazing weekend. Just want to welcome you to Central Christian Church Online. Listen, uh, wherever you may be, uh, whoever you are, wherever you are all over the world, we are just so excited that you chose to spend a few moments hanging out with us, worshiping our God. I want to invite you, particularly if you're on our Facebook platform, to start a watch party wherever you are. You'll notice on that page there's a share arrow. You can click that arrow. It'll be a drop down that I give you the option to start a watch party. And so would you please uh, start a watch party wherever you may uh, be, inviting friends from around the corner or around the world uh, to worship Jesus with us. Hey, listen. We're super excited. Um, the first weekend in August, we will be having our second uh, unity service with uh, our Iglesia worship, our New Life worship, our Beloit campus. It's gonna be absolutely phenomenal. You wanna get ready for the first weekend in August for our unity service. That will also be a baptismal weekend. And so if you're interested in being baptized, we wanna encourage you. There's an opportunity for you to fill out that information uh, on our Connect card, our virtual Connect card. Um, you'll see that card if you go to I'm New. You can click that tab uh, online. It'll have a virtual connect card for you to let us know uh, if you want to be baptized. If this is your first time, your first time in a long time, we want to encourage you uh, to stay connected with us using that online connect card. So please fill that out. Let us know um, how we can serve you uh, and how, if you're interested in serving here at Central, how we can get you plugged in with all the amazing things we have happening around here throughout the week. Um, so listen, uh, another big announcement. For you who have small children, our preschool will be opening up this fall. We have some of the best teachers in the Beloit area that love to teach, but also love to encourage uh, our children and helping them understand just how important they are, just how valuable they are, just how special and significant they are. And so if you're interested uh, in registering for preschool, please know that space is limited. Um, we are taking all the necessary precautions to make sure that um, everything is sanitized, clean. We put policies and procedures in place to protect your children. Um, so if you need or have any more additional information for you. I got an email for you. I want you to look at centralwired.com uh, backslash preschool. centralwired.com backslash preschool and you can reach uh, our amazing director uh, Miss Brianne Holdorf. She's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, check her out and she will reach back for you with all the additional information you need about preschool this fall. Core 52 is going down Monday through Thursday. You can jump into a small group on Core 52 by going to centralwire.com and click a day that works for you. Those groups are, are having a great time and so we wanna encourage you to jump in uh, to continue to grow in your faith and connect in community with other people who are also growing in their faith uh, every single week. Listen, last thing I wanna invite you to do, I wanna invite you right now uh, to grab your communion elements as we got another amazing, amazing word from the captain himself, Pastor Dave Clark. So grab your cracker and your water, uh, grab your juice and your pancake, whatever that is. Uh, we like to say around here, it is not about the element, but it's reverencing who the element represents. That's the most important thing. And let's just buckle our seatbelt and get ready for an amazing time of worship. Uh, we always wanna encourage you every week, don't just spectate, but participate in the worship. We wanna encourage you to lift your hands. We wanna encourage you to shout amen. We wanna encourage you to throw your towel at the TV if Dave says something that gets you excited. But participate in this worship. And as you do that, I believe that Jesus Christ will meet you right where you are. Amen? Let's hop into worship. Darkness is fading Walls of fear That brick by brick will come down Your light will shine Lifting me out of the shadows And here and now I know where my breakthrough is found 
will shout my way up to the mountain I will take all of the truth that we promised I'm gonna praise, and I'm gonna praise And I'm gonna push through till every lie crumbles I'm gonna dance in the midst of the rain I'm gonna rest in the arms of the Father I'm gonna praise, and I'm gonna praise There's a sound There's a sound Shout it out, here we go. So I'm gonna sing my way out of the bed. I'm gonna shout my way up to the mountain. And I will take all of the truth of the promise. I'm gonna praise, and I'm gonna praise. And I'm gonna push through till every dark crumble. I'm gonna dance in the midst of the rain. Check 
you staying at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Man, it's great to be in the Father's house, whether we're all gathering together or whether we're in our individual homes. Isn't it great to know that the Father himself is with us? What a great time we're having in worship, and everybody, this is the best part of the service where we get an opportunity to continue to worship the Lord in our giving. And the fact that we're able to give says one thing, that our God in heaven is continuing to provide for all of our needs according to his riches and glory. So if God's been good to you, if you've been continuing to uh, be compensated throughout this pandemic, I want to encourage you right now um, to think about what your gift is going to be to the Lord, that God who uh, supplies all of our need and gives us everything that we have. Um, our online host right now providing the Give app, uh, the link for you to give right now. So please uh, click that link on your online platform and uh, provide your tithe or your offering uh, right there. We also have opportunities uh, for you to give to our Dollar Club, which has been an ongoing ministry where we take those dollars that we give, uh, that we receive from you guys, and we give it to needy families uh, in the area. So if you know a family that, that's been struggling, uh, that you want to nominate for the Dollar Club, we want to encourage you to please submit uh, those names of those individuals or those families to us, and we will make sure that we bless uh, one or two of those families that you nominate um, for the Dollar Club. I gotta give you a, prick, a, a quick praise report on this. Uh, you remember last week we mentioned about the family that was homeless uh, that was awarded the Dollar Club uh, last week or the week before. Uh, we just got word after we prayed for them. Um, that family now has a home, 
Um, they're on their way um, to another state to live and, and, and things are going well. And so we just thank God for answered prayer. Uh, and how we were able to be a blessing to that family in their time of need. So listen, uh, these dollars and your giving really, really matters, everybody. So I want to encourage you to continue to give um, so we can be a blessing um, and serve you to the best of our ability. Amen. Hey, also, um, grocery donations. Um, that's been a huge thing that we've been doing as well. And so I want to continue to encourage you while you're out grocery shopping, if you would grab an extra bag of groceries um, and fill that up with uh, groceries, particularly non-perishables for families in the area that have been hit hard, that are food insecure, that are still trying to recover uh, from this corona epidemic that's been laid off of work, furloughed, etc. cetera. Um, those donations matter. We've been able to feed thousands of families at this point. And so please, please continue your grocery giving and we're gonna continue to serve the people uh, right here in our area. I wanna continue to pray uh, for those um, who've been struggling and those who are ready to give right now. Amen, let's pray. God, we just thank you right now for the opportunity, the opportunity, God, to give to you. God, you've been so good to us, and Father God, we count it an honor and a privilege to be able to give to you a portion of what you've given to us. And we pray, God, that every single dollar we give, whether it be our tithe, whether it be our offering, whether it be uh, our dollar club contribution, whether it be groceries, God, that those offerings, God, would go to be a blessing to families and be a blessing to ministries and support the work that we're doing here to provide excellent opportunities for our people to grow and be blessed and be encouraged. Father God, would you please continue to show your favor over those families who have been hit hard financially, who have been hit hard and are food insecure right now, God. I'm asking you, we're asking you as a church family, oh God, would you be Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides for every single one of our needs according to your riches and glory. And God, we want to hear about more praise reports, of how you showed up, how you opened the door, how you provided a way where there was no way. And God, we'll be so ever careful to give your name the praise and glory and honor for all of it, because to you, all praise, glory, and honor are due. So I pray in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, y'all. Let's go back into worship.
forever by my side I want my time, church, let's shake the mountain Shake the mountains, break the walls apart Open the heavens, almighty God you are Overcome, defender of my heart By his power alone, let's sing by your power Oceans open wide, your fire falls, heaven and earth collide. King Jesus, forever by my side. Yeah, yeah. your power and your presence, it breaks strong. Oh, King of heaven, for when Everybody, I love you. I miss you. I thank God for you. And I'm grateful that we have this teaching moment where we can share God's word together. But you know something? I, I, I think it's inadequate. I, I'm grateful that our church offers more, that we have a great teaching pastor in, in Ray McElroy. And you can join him every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. on Facebook and get his second take. And so please, please do that. You will experience God as you grow in the Word of God. Um, you know, when this first started, this unprecedented season we're going through, I kept thinking to myself, man, I can't wait till this problem is past. But now, four months into this thing and still uncertain about the future, you know what I've realized? Um, life sometimes can become a problem that's too hard to solve. Uh, have you been there? Problems in your marriage that feel too hard to solve? Problems in your parenting that feel too hard to solve? Um, and you wonder, you know, what do you do? What do you do with your finances when they become problems too hard to solve? Uh, where is God? Do you ever wonder why he allows these hard, difficult, challenging problems to erupt in your lives? I, I know I've been through seasons like that one was uh, that stands out in my memory was 17 years ago. We were crammed in into a small car on a dusty, bumpy road in Haiti. Uh, there were five of us, the driver, um, my Debbie and I, Wilkie, whom we were trying to adopt and make our son, and his aunt. She was going like as a witness. She was going with us to the U.S. consulate in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. We were going to meet uh, our, our lawyer there, our Haitian lawyer. And um, the Haitian government had approved the adoption. In Haiti, Wilkie was our son, and we were so excited. I mean, the next step was to get the approval of the U.S. government, and um, it seemed like that would be easy. I mean, we're American citizens. Uh, our documentation, our dossier was correct and filled out and complete, uh, translated in French and English. We had bribed whoever needed to be bribed on the Haitian side. Now all we needed was the approval of the U.S. government. And so it was about a mile, excuse me, about an hour drive. 
And that whole hour, I, I, I just prayed to God and praised God. And I remember there were, I was kind of looking out the window and we passed a couple of dead bodies by the side of the road. And I just thank God that we were getting Wilkie out of such a dark and difficult place. Um, in fact, when we get to the consulate in Port-au-Prince, we're sitting in like an entryway area waiting for our appointment, our names to be called. And I just continue to pray to God and thank him for the victory that he would surely give us. Uh, we were, our names were called. We were ushered into uh, an office and the consulate officer immediately told us um, that we needed to realize that this adoption would never be approved. And I'm like, what? Why? He said, you folks might as well get on a plane, go back to the U.S., and forget you ever met this boy. We're like, you're kidding me. He's, his adoption has already been approved in Haiti. He's already our son here. I mean, we're responsible for his care, his education, um, to be his family. And this officer, I couldn't believe it. I think my wife wanted to go over the table at him. But, but he says, um, hey, listen. When you get back on that plane, you go back to the States and you leave Haiti, um, no one's going to come after you because people abandon children in Haiti all the time. And that's it. We're ushered out of the office. We're down on the street. I mean, it was like a, a kick in the stomach. We're dazed, but we're back in the car. And now we're being driven to the orphanage, the girls' orphanage, where we'd been staying and shocked and staggered. I, I remember going back into that little 12 by 12 uh, concrete block room, so hot, suffocating. Um, and there was a mattress on the floor. That's where we slept. And we just plopped down on that mattress. And on the outside, uh, I got my, my arm over my eyes, but I am just crying. And, and on the inside, I'm railing against God. God, what is up with this? How could this happen? I mean, we're Christians. We're your children. Uh, we're Americans. We did what we're supposed to do. We paid thousands and thousands of dollars. Or, or what are we going to say to our church people? God, what are we going to do? Why'd you let this happen, God? Why doesn't anything ever work out for me? God, what are we going to do? Now, that was my dark moment of despair. My life had become a problem too hard to solve and too painful to, to process. And, and I'm sure you've been there. Um, you find out that your son's addicted to crack or that your teenage daughter is pregnant. What are you going to do? You find out that there's something wrong with a baby. Just had an ultrasound and they give you the bad news. And you were hoping that this little bundle of joy would somehow save your marriage. Now, what are you going to do? I mean, you lost your job. You were already living paycheck to paycheck. And, and now the unemployment is running out. What are you going to do? Life can become a, a problem too hard to solve. Too painful to process. And, and, and if you've been there, if you're living there right now, man, uh, this little book written by the brother of Jesus, uh, a, a guy named James, his book is just for you. It's for anybody and everybody who finds their lives as problems too hard uh, to solve, too painful to process. Here's the opening sentence of his book. When trouble of any kind, when trouble of every kind comes your way, surrounds you, consider it an opportunity. Are you kidding me? An opportunity to what? To lose your mind? To cry your eyes dry? To get angry and frustrated? To want to give up? What kind of opportunity? Here's how James continues to write. It's an opportunity to embrace the wisdom of God. James writes like this. If you want to know what God wants you to do in your problem that's too hard to solve, too painful to process, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him. He will gladly tell you. God is always willing to give you a 
bountiful supply of wisdom. He gives this gift to all who ask him. It's as simple as that. But when you ask him, be sure that you are really expectant. Be sure you really expect him to tell you. For a doubtful mind will be an unsettled wave, like a wave on the sea, driven and tossed in this direction and that by the wind. Every decision you then make will be uncertain. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been in that space? Every decision, you're not quite sure how this is going to work out. In fact, you turn this way and that way, making decision after decision, correcting yourself, correcting course because of your uncertainty and your insecurity. James goes on to write, if you don't ask God with faith, don't expect the Lord to give you any solid answer. Don't expect him to give you anything. Now, there's lessons that immediately jump out that I've learned for my life and that I wanted to share with you. And the first lesson is this. God, when, when, we have, when our lives have become a problem too hard to solve, too painful to process, God has actions. God desires for us to take specific actions. And it's not just what he wants us to do that's going to get us past the problem, that's going to help us overcome. It's how he wants us to do it. God has a plan for us to execute. And get this, this is awesome. God will give you everything you need to succeed. He's got actions for you to take. He's got a plan for you to execute, get you past the problem, help you overcome, and he's gonna give you along the way everything you need to succeed. That's God's heart to us, but as James continues to write, we uncover our responsibility to God. What are we responsible for? God says, here's what I'll do. I'll give you everything you need to succeed. I'll give you actions to take, a plan to execute, and here's what I want you to do. Number one, we must be willing to do what God wants us to do. No matter how crazy it may seem, no matter how off the charts it may be, if God says it, we do it, that settles it. Number two, we must have a keen sense of expectancy that we look to tomorrow with great hope, that we anticipate that God is at work to our good, that we anticipate that God makes everything beautiful and it's time that we anticipate that God is able to do abundantly, exceedingly, immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. We have this keen sense of expectancy, but also because it's a journey, because it takes time, because it unfolds. We need unwavering faith. No matter how circumstances appear, no matter how long it takes, no matter what comes against us, we need unwavering faith. And finally, we, we need the humility to ask God for wisdom. Now, personally, uh, the, the, a slice of scripture that has taught me more about wisdom than any other uh, practical wisdom and practicing wisdom comes from Ephesians chapter 1. I often pray this prayer of Paul for myself and pray it for you. And here's how Paul prays. I keep asking that the glorious Father may give you the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit of wisdom. That's God's wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know God better. Uh, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That means like flooded with light in order that you may know the hope that you would experience the hope to which he has called you and his incomparably great power by which he raised Jesus from the dead. The same power God used to raise Jesus from the dead is available to you and I. And so out of this text, I find three wisdom truths. Number one, wisdom. When we get wisdom from God, we actually experience God himself. We experience all that is God. Primarily, we experience his love. We experience his joy. We experience his peace as we come to grips with the fact that our God has actions for us to take, we can follow directions, that he has a plan for us to execute, and that he's going to give us everything that we need to succeed. Oh my gosh, our hearts swell with gratitude, our hearts swell with love and joy and peace. But, but check this out. 
Wisdom is also an experience of God's hope. Now you know everything's going to work out to your good. Now you know no matter how ugly it feels in the moment, he's got a beauty out there in your future. He's going he's gonna to do transformative work. And so you just keep hoping. You keep hoping. You keep hoping. This is not a flimsy hope. You anchor all your life, all your emotion, all your dreams on this hope, and you don't let go of hope. And wisdom truth number three, you actually experience God's incomparably great power. Now, I find this greatly illustrated. You've got to understand that James, who writes this little book, he's an Old Testament guy. He knew the Old Testament backward and forward, had memorized much of it. The people who are reading this letter for the first time, they're Old Testament people. They know the Old Testament backwards and forwards. And so what? There's an Old Testament story that illustrates for me how we can integrate these wisdom truths in our lives, why we can, how we can appropriate from God, all that we need to succeed, the, the actions and the, the plan to execute. And it's a story from 1 Samuel chapter 30. It's a story of David. Remember David and Goliath? Well, now he's older. In fact, he's leading a little army of 600 men. And here's how the story opens in 1 Samuel 30. David and his men reached Ziklag. Ziklag was their home. It was their, their village. It's where their families lived. It's where they had their possessions and their herds and flocks. It's where they made their life. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now on the third day, that strikes a chord in the heart of a believer because we know that our Jesus, though executed brutally on a bloodstained cross on a Friday. On the third day, Sunday, Jesus is risen from the dead victorious. And so when we see that phrase on the third day, to us that means hope. To us that means the miraculous. To, to us that means now God, His incomparably uh, great power has been at work and the beautiful and the bountiful unfolds for a person's life. In fact, for the last two and a half years, my Debbie and I, have been praying every night that we pray to appropriate the supernatural power of God for our lives, our finances, our relationships, our children, their children. This power of God that is beyond compare. Well, what happens um, for David, of course, and his little army the third day didn't mean what it means to us as Christians. It was pointing toward Jesus that he would die on the cross, that he would be risen from the dead. But for David, it meant three days of hard riding and exhaustion and three days of dreaming about getting home, of dreaming about a comfortable bed and a hot meal, and more importantly, about family, children, wives coming around and embracing and welcoming this little army home. But on that third day, the dreams turned to dust and, and ash because they saw the smoke before they saw the town. They saw it off in a, in a distance, and as soon as they saw it, they kicked their horses into a, a high gallop. And as they rode into their village of Ziklag, it was gone. It was burned to the ground. Nothing was left, and no one was left. While they had gone off to do their thing, leaving their village unprotected, Amalekite raiders had come in and destroyed the whole place, burned it to the ground, stolen every woman and child and, and hauled them off into slavery, took all the flocks, took all the herds, took anything of value. And as uh, this little army rode into the main street of this burned down village and stirred up ash and dust, smoke, the soldiers dismounted. They collapsed to the ground. They lifted their heads toward heavens and just screamed out their pain. They dropped their faces in their hands and wept and wept. Their hearts were broken. And the Bible says they wept and wept until they could weep no more. And man, they went from sad to mad just like that. They wanted to kill David. Here's what the Bible says. David was greatly distressed because the men, his soldiers, were talking of stoning him. 
and this wasn't recreational. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But look at this. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. Oh my gosh. His family was gone. His flocks and herds stolen. His possessions taken off. His place burned to the ground. But all of his men are ready to kill him. But where does David go for strength? David found strength in the Lord his God. Now, how do you do that when life is a painful problem, a problem too hard to solve, too painful to process? How do you get strength when you feel like you're at the end of yourself? How do you get a strength from the Lord? Well, we can do it just as David did it. And he did it in the same way that we've learned already in this brief talk I've given you. Check it out. Number one, he understood God's heart. That God has actions he wanted David to take. This is how you find strength in the Lord. You understand God's heart, that he has actions he wants you to take. That he literally has a plan for your marriage, a plan for your finances that you can execute. And he will give you everything that you need to succeed. Number two, you understand your responsibility. First, that you just do what God says to do. Second, that you have this keen sense of expectancy that everything's going to work for the good. And you have this unwavering faith that no matter what things appear, God is going to act. In fact, he is going to act by his incomparably great power and you humbly ask God then for wisdom and when you get wisdom you experience God his love his peace his joy when you get wisdom you experience hope and that hope anchors you when you get wisdom you experience personally deeply in your life you experience the miracles set free by the incomparably great power of God and so here's what David does he asked God. That's what the text says. David asked the Lord, hey, should I chess, chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him specifically, yes, here's the plan. Go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. And so guess what David does? He gets up off his knees. He dusts off his robes climbs back on his horse, and his soldiers do the same. Just as they went from sad to mad just like this, now they see that their leader is obeying God, and they're going to obey him as well. So David and his 600 men set out. You, you, you see, when you, you have a financial problem too hard, to solve, you just do what God's word says about finances. And you keep doing what God's word says about finances. And when you've got marital problems that feel too painful to process and, and, and too hard to solve, you do what God's word says about marriage. Husbands, love your wives. The Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, love your husbands as the Lord. That's the solution to every struggle, every painful problem. God's got the answer right here. He'll give you the actions to take, the plan to execute, and everything you need to succeed. And you show unwavering faith that God will do what God has promised to do because here's what happens. As David leads his force, uh, they get to a point. I mean, they're all tired. They're all exhausted. They're all spent. But 200 of the men give up. They stop. They quit. They're not going any further. That's one third of his fighting force. And they are facing this incredibly formidable foe. But a third of his army cashes in. They're not going another step further. But here's what happens. Word of God says, David found the Amalekites. They're spread out across the field. They're, they don't have a perimeter established. Uh, there's no guards. They're not in military position. They, they don't have a, a defensive uh, posture. They're just partying. They're eating. They're getting drunk. They're drinking. They're dancing with joy because of the vast amounts of plunder. Well, David and his men, they rush in, slaughter them, and David gets back everything they had taken, all their families, all their flocks, all their herds, 
all their belongings. See, our God is faithful. It's not that we're so smart or we're so cunning or we're so able. It's that, that our God keeps his word. He gives us actions to take, gives us a plan to execute, gives us everything that we need to, to, to succeed. And, 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 and then we just do what he says, expecting victory with unwavering faith, trusting in the goodness of our God. Uh, what, what God did for David, he wants to do for you. I mean, he did it for me on that dark, Day of despair, 17 years ago, um, laying down on that mattress on a concrete floor, I, I rolled over on my side and saw my Bible right beside the, the mattress. I wiped the dirt off of it, picked it up, opened it up, and I began to read. And, and I began to pour my heart out to God. And as I bared my soul to God, He filled my soul. He restored my soul. He replenished the inner parts of my heart with hope and love and joy and peace. And guess what? He gives actions to take and a plan to execute and everything Deb and I needed to succeed. Well, we get up off that mattress. We get to the airport, we get back to the States, and we stay after, we continue to do what God had told us to do in the first place, stay after the process of the adoption until Wilkie is your son. And it was hard. It was really hard. In fact, my Debbie lived in Haiti for like nine months. But 10 months almost to the day from when we were denied, we're standing once again in the U.S. Embassy. And another embassy official is across an office from us. This man has sworn that he will personally make sure that Wilkie is never allowed to, to leave Haiti. <laughs> but God is at work, and it's seemingly almost against this man's will, he signs the papers. He approves the adoptions. Wilkie is our son. You see, when, when you don't know what to do, when you don't know what God is doing, when life is a problem too hard to serve and too painful to process, follow the counsel of James. If you want to know what God wants, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you, for he is always ready to give a bountiful supply of wisdom to all who ask. So that's what we're going to do right now as we participate in the Lord's Supper. Um, you have your elements, the the bread and the juice. And we're going to say we're sorry to God for when we tried to go in our own wisdom, try to work our own plans, when we took actions that backfired in our face and made matters worse. And now we're going to humbly listen to Him. So if you'll take the piece of bread, I'll pray over you right now. Our Father, um, we do ask that you bless this bread. We thank you for it. We thank you for all that represents the body of Jesus given as a sin offering to pay for all of our mistakes. And Lord, as we get ready to eat it together, we just say we're sorry for when we tried to do life on our own, by our own wisdom. And we're asking you right now, right now, Lord, humbly. We're asking for your wisdom. Lord, what do you want us to do? And we're, we're expectant. We're trusting that we'll hear from you, Lord. We're, we're trusting, Lord, with unwavering faith that you'll give us everything we need to succeed. And now if you take the cup and let me pray over the cup. Our Father, I pray that as our people drink the blood of Christ, that you will give them each the spirit of wisdom and revelation, one, to know you better, that you would flood the eyes of their heart with light, that they would know the hope to which you have called them and the incomparably great power to know it, to experience it, by which you raised Jesus from the dead. I mean, if, if you can raise Jesus from the dead, you can give us everything we need to succeed. We praise you, Lord. We see that your plans are good and we'll execute them. We know that the actions that, that, that you call us to trigger you working out everything, making everything beautiful in its time, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys, and again, I encourage you guys uh, to tune in again on Wednesday evening at 7. Take advantage of Ray's dynamic teaching as he communicates the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.
Awesome time we've had today. Man, it was just been so great worshiping with you guys this weekend. Um, I want to quick remind you about the uh, Unity Service. First weekend in, in August, our Unity Service with our Spanish speaking worship, our inner city worship, our Beloit campus. That's also going to be a baptismal uh, Sunday. So if you're interested in being baptized, reach out to us at the church or fill out that online connect card and let us know that you want to be baptized. We will follow up with you and we will put you on the schedule, all right? Um, please, please, um, this is your first time, your first time in a long time. We want to stay connected with you. We want to encourage you also to fill out that online connect card. You'll see it on the website. I'm new. Click that. 
The online connect card will show up, fill out your information. We will follow up with you and get you plugged in with all the amazing things we have happening here at Central Christian. Uh, also, preschool. If you're interested in preschool in the fall, want to encourage you to uh, reach out uh, to our program director, Ms. Breanne. Um, you can reach her at centralwired.com backslash preschool. centralwired.com backslash preschool. We want to get your kids registered as soon as possible. We are taking all the necessary precautions to keep your kids safe. We've got amazing teachers ready to go, ready to love, and ready to teach your children. Um, finally, everybody, um, just want to encourage you to continue to drop off your groceries. Um, we're going to continue to feed people all over the area. Everybody, we love you so much. And until we see you next time, I just want to leave you with this thought that my prayer is that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that the Lord would make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord would allow his countenance to fall upon you and bring you peace in Jesus' name until we meet again. Amen.